here at the Independence Reform Bible Church, we do give um, you folks a, uh, the other congregants a, an opportunity to question the uh, message, uh, message and the messenger, I suppose. Um, if you raise your hand, please wait. We have a microphone. We have a question. Kind of interesting to go into Nehemiah with uh, Seth's testimony behind him, and then to hear your prayer and I'm trying to kind of put some things all together. So this is probably more a question about your prayer. <laughs> um, so I totally get praying for Jeremiah, and I understand being a personal fan of the fact that Haman was hanging on his own gallows that he yeah. would pray that this Chester would fall into his own pit, but should we not be praying for his repentance? Yeah, um, we should be. And um, since the fear of the Lord is beginning of wisdom, um, a man like that generally is not going to wise up until he falls in that pit. Um, Jeremiah the prophet, and, and this is something we're going to talk about next week because Nehemiah prayed those type of prayers as well. We'll see that next week. We didn't have time to get into it today. Um, but Jeremiah prayed those prayers as well. And um, we see those type of prayers directed towards people who are who are preventing other people from getting the, the message. And Jeremiah is, is, a, is quite a um, um, uh, study here, Jeremiah the prophet, because he's called the weeping prophet. And we know he loved the people. He wrote Lamentations. And... Um, if you ever get a chance to read Lamentations all the way through, it's, it's actually a song. And so it's a dirge, if you will. It's a sad song. We, we don't really do sad songs so much here. But a lot of what's in the Bible are, are, are sad songs, songs of lament. And that's what uh, Lamentations is. It's actually a song. And the entire, the entire, entire book is a song. And it's a, uh, it's a sad song. So, and, and Jeremiah loved those people. That's why he wept. But when someone came along tried to stop his message that was necessary for them to repent and believe. That's when he pulled out those types of prayers. Those types of prayers were not for everybody who didn't believe him. They, they were not for that. But there were very specific people who were trying to stop his message. And that's what this man, Chess, Chessie's trying to, do, trying to do. He's trying to stop the message of Jesus Christ to Jeremiah and that's why we pull out those types of prayers. More, I'll take more questions on that if you like. Question. I was just going to say that all throughout the Psalms is imprecatory prayer and um, seems like it's been negated by the nicer than Jesus um, church in America. Um, we've been kind of brainwashed and thinking, oh, we have to be so nice, but we really do need to pray against the powers of darkness to be able to hold up the truth. Um, I think that's really important. One of my favorite songs is Psalm 5. And it's not very nice in the eyes of American Christianity. I just was thinking about Paul, though, too. I mean, he definitely was one that was against the church, and yet the Lord saved him. And so I just wanted to, you know, remember how Christ worked there. And he was judged first with blindness. But then he also could see the light, and he brought many other people to Christ, who was the light of the world. Yeah, there are there are different ways that God destroys his enemies. One way he destroys his enemies is to make us make us friends, right, right. and uh, he made he made Paul his friend. And uh, it's it's our job. See, our appeal is to God to, to to make things right. Sometimes he destroys them as an example to everyone else. Haman, for example. And I've even asked some of my good Christian friends when Haman. In the book of Esther, is hoisted on his own card, if you will, hung on his own gallows. Was that a good thing or a bad thing? It was justice. It was a very good thing. In our present culture, Christian culture, we have a hard time answering that question, don't we? Oh man, poor Haman and his sons. And you know what? I do feel that. What a horrible thing. And, I'm not really sure how that whole hanging thing took place. We have our idea of hanging. I, from what I'm able to read about the way they hung people back then, it wasn't as nice as our way. 
Um, Suffocation, not a snapping of the neck. It might have been even worse than that. I think that's what, it, from what I can read, it's an impalement. So it took a long time. It was horrible. It was ugly. You didn't die right away. But this man, Haman, was about to wipe out all the Jews. And so God, in his sovereignty, made an example out of him and gave tremendous confidence to the Jews to save their lives. And uh, the book of Esther, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting thing. A lot of people became Jews, it says. A lot of people apparently were converted to the God of the Jews through this activity. And I'll tell you what, I, I, uh, I make a really bad God myself. That, that's what an understatement that is. I, I, I wouldn't know how to do these kinds of things. God does, we must, we must trust Him. And He does make His enemies His friends at times. And, I, and, and, and speaking, of, um, speaking of Lamentations, Lamentations, you know, Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, sit, sit on my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. We, we have a tendency to think that that's you know, God dominating his enemies, and they're all beaten down into a point, whatever. But the book of Lamentations talks about, Jer Jeremiah makes an interesting statement, he says that God abandoned his foot, Israel his footstool. And what he's saying there is that his footstool there is an endearing thing. And um, I believe when it says, you know, sit on my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool, I think that's not talking about it to, when he beats all his enemies into submission and there's nothing but left but power. I think it's talking about when that's the point when he makes all his enemies his friends. Over time. Yes. I'll try to, because I, I think my, my question also is similar to this is trying to harmonize uh, Jesus tells us to, to love our enemies, to do all these different things, to essentially put up with them uh, in a lot of different ways. Um, and so just because we can pray those imprecatory prayers, do we have the humility to ask God what he wants more than what we want in those situations? And, and so I kind of wonder when you talk about in this situation with Nehemiah, um, and just in general, that the world will hate those that love God, and they're never going to love it, period, end of story, and that's the end of your, your last prayer. I don't, again, I, I love your, the, the follow-up sermon. I, I'm trying to understand, I guess, um, in, they didn't hate him just because they, he loved God. He was threatening their power base. He went on to take away their tax base. He undermined their entire way of life. And they knew that when he was walking in. And so I think it's, I, I fear it's simplistic looking back or now to say, Oh, they hate us because we're Christians, or that he hated them, him because he loves God. When we question, when we when we threaten people's way of life, their form of justice, their tax base, their all these things, it's not just God. And I, think, I wonder, just being aware of that matters, and that they're always going to hate us. I don't think, you know, Columbia is that you know they hate you. I would hope that they see your love, and when that love it's close to us. We feel judged sometimes, but not by the person, but by the law that we represent. So I, I don't know if you're going to be more addressing that in seconds. Sure. The, the I, but I can address that now. Yeah. Somewhat too. Yeah. Go ahead, Seth, and then I'll, I'll address it. Thank you, Seth. Don't, don't you love interaction? <laughs> because I do, I do want to address that. And I think, yes, on the surface, they absolutely see our love. Um, that's one of the first things that brings them there. What turns them away is where the love comes from. That's the issue. They see the love and they're attracted by that. They love that they can come here and know they're going to get a meal. They're going to get a bed. I mean, we've got a guy living with us right now from the street. He's either on the street or in our house. Like that's how it is. They love where the, they love that love. The issue is when I begin to tell them, "Do you know why I do this?" And they say, "Well, well, well because Christ has given us two great commandments: love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind; love your neighbor as yourself." Now, for me to truly love you, here's what I need to tell you. And when I confront them with the gospel and Jesus Christ, and the fact that he said there is no other way to God except through him, that they must humble themselves to agree with God that they are wicked, godless sinners who hate Christ and his gospel. Because the, the scriptures also say that right now, if they're not regenerate, they're at war with God. Even if they consider themselves neutral, 
They're not. Because Christ said, you were either for me or you were against me. There is no middle ground here. So it's getting them to say, do you agree with God that you're a sinner and that you're at war with him? No, I'm not at war with God. I, I don't agree to that. It's that is also the very thing, that same love, the source of that love is the very thing that will turn them away and they won't come back for a while. And then they'll come back and then they'll hear it again. And so, so I guess, yes, they do see the love. But the issue is we only see the depth of Christ's love against the backdrop of his infinite holy righteousness and judgment and wrath against sin. Because Christ did not come into the world to condemn the world, right? But he didn't need to because the very next verse tells you the world's already condemned. And that's the problem. So I, I think, I, I hear what you're saying. And I say yes to that. Yes, they need to see our love. Um, but I'd also say it's the source of that love that will drive some away and yet captivates others and brings them to salvation, which we're seeing as well. So it, it's both there. Yeah, th thank you, Seth. I would, and, um, to, to follow up on that a little bit, Lars, um, it actually says they hate him because he, it, 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 because he you know, sick the welfare of the Jews. I, I do believe that it was a tax base. But I don't think it was a tax base the way we think tax base. I think they, uh, yeah, it, it was plunder. Um, they might be able to sell the tax base with a wall. Who knows? Maybe not. But um, the, the parallel that I can think of is, and those of you who've ever studied uh, Alfred the Great, who united England. He was hated by the Danes because he defended the English. That was, that was what he did. And before he came along, England was just ripe for plunder. And every, you know, the, the English would, would uh, they, they'd grow crops, and the Danes would leave them alone for a while until they got their society going again, built houses, planted vineyards. You know, got that then the Danes would come and plunder them again and, and strip them of everything. And then they do the whole cycle over again. I think I think that's what's happening here as well, in this in this case. A lot more could be said about that, though. Um, one thing I, I would I, I would um, in, in a modern sense. How many of you remember the um, the uh, Christmas tidal wave tsunami in Indonesia about five six years ago now? I think about that time. And do you remember what happened when Christians tried to bring bring relief? Remember what happened? The relief was welcome until the Christians began to preach the message. And then the Christians were told, get out. We don't want your message or your, or, 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 or your, or your food or your goods or anything like that. This question plays a little off the last. Um, no doubt the, the Supreme Court decision is an atrocious sin. Um, for men like Chester to stand in the way of someone else's belief in Jesus. An atrocious sin. But in all those sorts of things, as believers, as true Christians, how do we separate the issue and hate the sin but love the sinner? <laughs> you know, but um, maybe the better question is how do you how do you deal with believers who do truly believe that? Sure. Yeah. You, you know, um, here we go. <laughs> yeah, Psalm 5 addresses this. Do you have it in front of you, John? Psalm 5. John, why don't you read that for us? Can you bring that up from there? Psalm 5 is pretty short. Give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my groaning. Hear the sound of my cry for help, my King and my God, for to you I pray. In the morning, O Lord, you will hear my voice. In the morning, I will order my prayer to you and eagerly watch. For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. No evil dwells with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. You destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. But as for me, by your abundant loving kindness, I will enter your house. At your holy temple, I will bow in reverence for you. O Lord, lead me in your righteousness because of my foes. Make your way straight before me. There is nothing reliable in what they say. Their inward part is destruction itself. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongue. 
Hold them guilty, O God. By their own devices, let them fall. In the multitude of their transgressions, thrust them out, for they are rebellious against you. But let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy, and may you shelter them, that those who love your name may exult in you. For it is you who blesses the righteous man, O Lord. You surround him with favor as with a shield. So we see there that, um, as, as John just read, that God hates the doers of iniquity. Don't say hates the sin, hates the sin, hates them. Tough stuff. But see, that's that's a separate question, though, from what I'm supposed to do. I am supposed to love my enemies. That's in the Old Testament, um, that's in the Old Testament, and it's in, in the New Testament. We make a distinction between my enemies, though, and God's enemies. Nehemiah have, or Jeremiah have a lot of personal enemies. But he prayed the prayers against God's enemies. <coughs> and those, those who would do that. And it's, it's this is tough stuff. Um, if you want to read, um, if you want to read a, a good section, um, what's his name? Um, come on, the guy, oh uh, boy, it's up, I forget his name. He's a professor of Trinity. Um, Car D.A. Carson. D.A. Carson has a good section in his book on the gagging of God. A good section on the difficult, the difficult uh, challenge of what does God's love actually mean and to what extent does it go. For example, we have uh, these six things does the Lord hate, yea, seven are abomination unto him in Proverbs chapter 6. And he talks about things that he hates. And it, it, it talks about certain sins. And if you, if you read it, then it gets personal. It talks about certain sins. It's like 616. And um, then it says, uh, hands that shed innocent blood. Um, feet that are swift to running the mischief. So God hates their feet and their hands. And at the end he says, he who sows discord among his brother. So it's got, got the whole guy involved at the end. Difficult stuff. Thanks for the question, uh, Sid. Uh, appreciate it. Yeah. Go ahead and read that if you would again, John. You can come up and read that. The end, of, the end of Psalm 139 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts, and see if there be any hurtful way in me, and lead me in the everlasting way. But this is after, he said, Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with the utmost hatred. They have become my enemies. And then he says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. So, take from there. Yeah, no doubt about it. Uh, it's like, you encouraging us that he recognizes it. He recognizes, but he's saying, search me, O oh God, to say that my heart is pure, that I'm hating those who hate you, that I'm following your thoughts, not my own, not my own enemies. See, I, I fear we live in a time, and I'm glad we can have this discussion, because this is serious business here. This is not an academic discussion here that we're having. Every one of us, I hope, will face these kinds of decisions in, in our lives. If we're not, I don't know what we're doing. We've got to get out of that ivory tower again. But I, I fear this is our problem. We, we want to make peace with those who hate God, and, and, and we want to hate those who hate us. Opposite. Opposite there. It's, it's our job to hate those who, love, who hate God. It's our job to love those who hate us. We do the opposite. The guy who cuts us off, we hate him. Oh yeah. The, the, guy, the guy who curses God's name, we want to be we want to be friends with him. We got, we got it wrong. Yeah. Um, just a little commentary on the question of is it simplistic to say that um, they hated Nehemiah because God? It's not really simplistic. It's getting to the bedrock of the issue because ultimately Nehemiah's righteousness challenged their sin. So like, yes, they're tax-based, yes, those things, but those things came out of a sinful and greedy heart. So by Nehemiah's righteousness, by his following God, by protecting the welfare of the children of Israel, then he was following God. So ultimately they did hate him because of God's grace in his life. So it, it's not simplistic so much as it's getting to the very heart of the issue. Um, like when we, if we go out more, or we're talking to someone, or we're witnessing to someone on the street, like for us, it's going to abortion clinics quite often. When I'm talking to somebody, they do hate me because of God, because when I'm standing there and saying, 
you right now are hating your own flesh and blood and your own child and you are hurting them right now. You are destroying them and murdering them. That person hates me because I'm calling out their sin. And Nehemiah, by his actions, by caring for the welfare of the children of Israel, was calling out their sin. And when we stand up there with signs, we're calling out their sin. So they do hate you because of God. It's not simplistic so much as it is just getting straight to the heart. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, Seth. I want to follow up. Did I hear it say another hand? I did not. Okay. Well, and just, just on the heels of that whole thing, um, I think it's always important to understand and remember where that phrase came from, you know, hate the sin, love the sinner, was actually a Muhammad Gandhi quote. Um, the other thing is, how do you square that with Malachi 2.17, which says, you have wearied the Lord with your words, but you say, well, how have we wearied him? By saying everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Um, th those are strong words. God does not delight in evil, nor, again, he doesn't cast sin into hell, does he? he does, it's not an abstract thing. We've got to understand that. It's not that God at the end of time judges and casts sin abstractly into hell. He throws sinners into hell. And that's what I think we have to square with. Which is why we should speak judgment, but with love and a tenderness that says, these are souls which will be damned for eternity unless they repent and believe in Jesus Christ. I think, and I think that's the balance, is if, if what we're doing is standing up screaming, you're going to hell and, you know, and there's just no love there, I think we're sinning in that as well. That is sin. Um, because while Christ clearly at times um, was very hard, uh, he also always called all men everywhere to repent and believe. So, yeah, and we, and we see that in the very beginning where, where God pronounces judgment on Adam and Eve, but at the same time pronounces redemption. At the same time. In the same breath, if you will. At the, at the very same time. Good, good questions here. Um, Appreciate these, uh, this input. Uh, went a little bit longer than what I was thinking. It's good I stopped what I did. Um, but this is this is reality here, my friends. Uh, the wickedness is coming on us in waves. It's it's everywhere. What are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to respond? We have examples in the Bible. Um, certainly Nehemiah, certainly Je Jeremiah, certainly Malachi. Um, these men all ministered in difficult times. We're not seeing anything new as far as that's concerned, my friends. It's new for us, but it's not new. Okay. Um.